Hello, everyone out there in the live stream. It's great to have you here with our watching our recording. And here with Brian, Kelly, and Sean. We're all about to kick this off. You all about ready for this? Sounds yeah. good. Right on, right on. All day. Great to see you out there and in the live stream. So, yeah, let, let's do this. What episode are we on? 226. All right. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 226, recorded March 24th, 2021. I'm Michael Kennedy. And I am Brian Aachen. Oh, I'm <laughs> my turn, <laughs> sorry. And I'm Kelly Schuster Paredes. Hey. And I'm Sean Tiber. Kelly and Sean, welcome. It's great to have you both here. Super, super excited to have some teachers in the house. <laughs> super yeah. excited to be here. Yeah. So if people yeah. don't know, Kelly and Sean are uh, hosts of uh, Teaching Python. Is that right for the podcast? That's, That's correct. Right. right. So Kelly is the teacher that codes and I am, thanks to our new merchandise, the coder that teaches. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So you guys both run a... Um, together co-host a great podcast and what's the general focus like if, if i was in the general teaching space and i wanted to learn how to bring like python and technology into my classroom that's the main audience what would you say well, the main audience at, well has grown it originally was designed just for teachers and i think we thought that they would be k-12 or maybe college teachers but it has developed into teachers in the developer world and businesses and we kind of bounce off each other's ideas. I am a love lifer teacher, and Sean is a geek. <laughs> <laughs> Together, you have the superpower. Fantastic. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, we've been learning a lot from each other over the last couple of years and having great conversations about what it means to be teaching code and why it's important and why it matters. Um, you know, this is such a huge part of everyone's lives now. And the earlier that we can start with students and helping them learn about coding, um, it really helps them in so many other areas of their lives. So Kelly and I just started recording it. We one day started pressing record on it, publishing the podcast. And I think we're a couple hundred thousand downloads later, um, still going strong. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, I, one of my passions is that I think people really, we don't need a million more CS students. What we need is a million people who have programming fluency and are passionate about something else and can combine those two things. So, yeah. Spot yeah on. I, I get a lot out of the podcast just as somebody that I don't, I'm not a teacher, but I teach people. So um, there's a lot of stuff around that too. I, so I like the podcast. Thank Absolutely. you. Thanks. Do you like uh, data classes? I really like data <laughs> classes a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of why I'm covering this. Uh, so there's a, there's an article called, uh, called by a person, Jack song who wrote data classes versus name tuple versus object, a battle of performance. And it's, you know, it's a, I, I was interested in this because I, I kind of thought that, um, that the, data I was I really like data classes but I thought I heard from somewhere that like they were slower than other stuff um I had used uh basically I'm, I used to use name tuples a lot um uh, but I, I really like the data class uh, abstraction and and the features that it has and I was slightly concerned I mean not very very much because they, they work fast enough for me but I was um interest I am interested in whether or not I am intentionally putting something in the code that I might have to refactor later. Um, but so uh, this, this article, he, he does a, a test example or, and times it for uh, using access. Was he, uh, let me read this. He does the size and speed of creating, reading and executing functions with objects named tuples and data classes. And the result is kind of there, they're really comparable. Uh, I, there is differences, but they're really close. So I think, I think for me, the outcome of this is, um, is that there, let me see if I can grab this table that it, it, it's about a wash. They're all kind of, uh, similar. So whatever works for your code, I say, go with it. Um, but I'd like to hear from other people. I'd like to, I'd like to know if, uh, if there's other studies out there that compare these, um, and either uh, validate the same thing or find some different result. I'd love to hear from it, from people. Yeah. A, a lot of these are measured in microseconds. And that's kind of 
beyond human comprehension unless you do a whole bunch of them (laughs) (laughs) that add those up. So for me, I think one of the real valuable things is, you know, like the the data classes, they can specify types like this thing is an integer and that thing is a date time and that's a string and that's an optional string. And I think that communicates a whole lot and then sort of follow on, like you can easily extend that to things like Pydantic for validation and conversion. And, you know, unless they're really far off, I, I think that this extra information it communicates is is highly valuable. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask uh, Kelly and Sean, like, do you even talk about types and data types? And how do you cover that with the younger I was, generation? I was actually just t- teaching that about an hour ago to uh, students. We cover that in the very first week about how objects have types and what you can do with different types of information. And it's a really basic thing that I think they need to know from the beginning because later on it just gets really confusing if you don't have at least this concept of, of typing. Um, yeah. We do try do, you know using type hints here and there. And I find that sometimes with teaching it's helpful because they have that visual reference. Like, oh, if I'm designing a function or I'm making a method in as part of a class, I can hint at what the types are and the students can see that as we're coding together and it makes it much clearer for them what the arguments are going to be or what the return values are going to look like. Yeah. And I was actually looking at this article from a whole, I do this, you know, 360 kind of look. I I was reading this article and I was like, oh my gosh, I love this because now I have an entryway into telling the kids about the e-finance. And I was telling Sean, I was Mm -hmm. like, do you know that Vimbo was, Vimbo was coded in Python? And I do this to him all the time. So this whole FinTech data classes kind of push for the kids. And then I started searching uh, real Python as I always do. And they have a great article about how they use data classes with uh, the cards, playing cards. So it's something that we don't really do the data classes part, but I do talk about a lot of data types. So I thought it was cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's pretty neat that you all actually do cover. I mean, you're going to run into problems if you try to concatenate an integer with a string. It's going to crash. And so you kind of got to say, look, numbers and numbers can go together. Strings and strings can go together. You don't have to go too deep in the theory, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my sixth graders, sixth graders can regurgitate it. They they can't stop. <laughs> so one of, one, Fantastic. One, one of the things I love about data classes is uh, the that you can specify the default values for all the fields, and you can do that with named tuples, but it's weird. It's a it's a weird add on that you have to do. So. Yeah, I've always yeah. found name tuples to be a little bit confusing to explain to other people. Like once you get yeah. it, you know it, but then you're trying to teach it to someone else. They're like, okay, it has this weird construct that doesn't yeah. doesn't follow yeah. a lot of the other stuff. Um, but I do like the data classes because it fo- seems to follow along with a string of really nice language features, like with F strings and data classes, where you know whether you want to use them or not, the they're well optimized and efficient compared to other options. You know, F strings can be faster in a lot of cases than previous formatting. Looks like data classes are continuing that trend in a really nice way. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. This next one I want to cover, but before I show on the screen, I want to ask you two, the guests, do you do stuff with any like micro, micro things like Raspberry Pi or any of the Adafruit stuff? No? Sean. Kelly likes to throw them at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not a Ninja Star. It's a, a one of those express boards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sean yeah, loves we have, them. <laughs> yeah. We have a ton of them in the classroom. Kelly has a love, hate, mostly hate relationship with hardware. <laughs> But we have a lot of hardware that we use for coding in Python and making things happen. Nice. All right. So let me let me put this one here on the screen and let me take take apart the title because there's a lot going on here. So this person, I, I'm, sorry, I'm not sure the name of the person who actually runs this blog, but it's the DIY life uh, about like little micro things. And oh, no, it's by Michael Clements right there. And the title is, can my water cooled Raspberry Pi cluster <laughs> beat my macbook so this guy built a water cool he has a water cooled raspberry pi little pieces and then got a a cluster of eight of them all running together and he said well this is pretty amazing let me see if i can uh, get this video to like sort of move up so y'all can see in the section here where where they're i mean this is a crazy looking device here uh, as long as we get rid of all that it's like what it sounds like a cluster of eight raspberry pies all working together and they're literally water cooled so they don't overheat and the question was well let's like throw some python math at it and see if there's like a good thing for say like data science or you know, maybe you got kids you want to learn stuff on it or or whatever 
and you know how to go. So there's a lot of interesting things. And I guess you know one of the the first takeaways is just wait, there's Raspberry Pi clusters and they're water cooled. What is this? This is crazy. Does it surprise yeah. you? No, I, so yeah. I had seen this before. I think I've actually seen one of these in person and they have, people have been building cases for these. It'll hold eight, 12, 16 of the, these stacked oh. up. And it, I always thought of it as a way to inexpensively learn about parallelizing, you know, clusters of machines, right? Like you can buy or build um, a cluster for a few hundred bucks instead of thousands of dollars. So they're great yeah. for learning, but I never thought anybody would try to like water cool it and make a performance <laughs> rig out of it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's really wild. It's really wild. So um, the other thing that I think is an interesting takeaway that I'm not going to cover because there's just too many little details and they rip by really fast in this presentation that I'm linking to, but there's all these tools for running Python code distributed across just multiple nodes of things that run Python. So the way they set it up over SSH to make them communicate and do message sharing so they can parallelize the computation is pretty neat. And I think it applies beyond the pies. It's just anything you can SSH to more or less. So that that's pretty interesting. So for some numbers, is there some numbers in here? I know he's got some graphs, uh, but I don't know. They put the numbers. I think the numbers are just in the video. Oh, wait, here we go. So uh, I'll just read them off, off this, give you some real quick numbers. So he has this uh, like wimpy core i5 HP laptops. So what, what am I going to I'm going to compute the number, uh, find all the primes up to a number, 10,000, 100,000, 200,000. So for the HP, it's like one and a half seconds, 74 seconds, and then almost five minutes, 267 seconds. So let me grab my MacBook Air, older one not the M1, and says, okay, that thing's a lot quicker, actually, surprisingly. So 0. 0.8 seconds and 83 seconds. Actually, that's a little slower. And then uh, as it gets longer, I think because it doesn't have the right cooling, the longer it takes, the more it slows down. And then he says, let me run it on one node on the cluster, which is 1.5 seconds, which is actually faster than the HP, but not quite as fast as the MacBook Air. And then runs it on the grid and gets it down to, instead of 355 seconds to 85 seconds for 200,000 of them. So uh, it's pretty fast, right? I mean, compared to these old slower computers, that that's kind of chugging along. Um, yeah. yeah, these yeah. new Raspberry Pi 4s that are out, the, the latest version, I mean, they're really fast and really powerful. Like people are using them to transcode, um, you know, video streams for Plex servers and Plex devices and things like that. You can run your whole house on it with home automation. Like there's a lot of power and it's still just like 35 bucks. Yeah, that's crazy. People are running uh, using like um, ad blocking DNS things for their local networks, all sorts of interesting things. So, well, I couldn't resist running this on my two things that I have <laughs> to see what I would get. And so I have a, a M, an M1 Mac Mini, which is quite fast. Those, those M1 chips are really crazy. And so um, instead of having 355 seconds on the MacBook Air or 85 seconds on the eight core water cooled cluster, mine's 91 seconds on my Mac Mini and it doesn't make a sound or get warm, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, that's single threaded. And then I ran it uh, multi threaded and got it down to 26 seconds, uh, which was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, and if you look at the actual, uh, this is the CPU load over time. And it turns out the way the algorithm they're using to break it down is the longer ones are much longer. And so the early ones finish, it's not an even distribution. So actually there's some room for improvements or, or whatever there. But uh, the other one, I want to just show you all because this is kind of crazy. I have a an Alienware sim racing setup that I have. And it actually just blew it. So it did 200,000 in 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a price, one that is expensive. I mean, that's like a straight price, but there's also a price in sound. Like I actually recorded it because it was so loud. Let me just play it back. I'm not sure how well this. Here it is just sitting there nice and quiet. Oh, it's starting to make some noise. I'll just keep talking normal so you can compare. But it's really kicking in right now. I'll move over close to it in a minute. Uh, 
How about that? That thing is screaming. Like you could barely talk over it if you're in the same room. But 10 seconds, it is pretty fast. <laughs> I think I have a robot vacuum that's quieter than that <laughs> when it's running. I, I think you need to crack that open and water cool it. Uh, you know, actually, this is the highest performance one you could buy from uh, Dell from Alienware that's not water cooled. And I'm like, I don't really want to have to maintain my computer, so I'm not getting a water cooled one. <laughs> I don't want to like take it in for its oil change or oil or whatever you got it. <laughs> no thanks. Yeah, one anyway. of the things though to, to uh, in the original um, uh, discussion in the video, there is a dis it's a it's single threaded for all the computers and then parallel on the on the uh, the mini or the not the minis the pies the, the pies yeah yeah but um, but then in the comments uh, some people said well. What about that? And so there's there's an update with all the data with the parallel too, and it's still really fast on the parallel. But um, and it, I think it's interesting to have the 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 speed comparison. But I think one of the things that's important that Sean points out is you get like two or three of these, and you can start to explore uh, parallel computing and distributed computing with under a hundred dollars. So. Um, yeah. That's... Don't give, please don't give him any more ideas. We have things all <laughs> over the classroom. I don't need any more like spy things. Wait, Ke Kelly, is there something you can water cool? Maybe like set up a water cooling thing. <laughs> no, but I am gonna get the water gun and start squirting him over if he keeps if he brings it over. <laughs> but like a comparison though would be like trying to get what six Mac Minis together, and and that's that's expensive, right? So, yeah, yeah, right. that's a lot. Right. And a lot of classrooms might have some of these laying around from other projects that you've done or a class set. And if you wanted to have a student do a, an individual project with it, you just start putting it together and, and you can make it work. It doesn't have to be water cooled in order to be a good learning experience. <laughs> so yeah. what, what is it with yeah. that? Is he's overclocking it? Is that the reason why yeah, it, it no. needs to be cooled? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can push them pretty hard and they, they heat up. It's just a small chip on it. And most of them will, you'll see people put fans and things like that on it, but the water cooling is the next level of I'm, I'm trying to push a pie <laughs> really, really far. Exactly. Yeah. I will point out in the, they, in the video, they linked to a multi-threaded thing, a uh, script and I ran the multi-threaded script and it gave me the same times and the C it only seemed to be using one CPU. It, it ran a bunch of stuff, but then I'll put all the work onto one of the cores. So in the show notes, I wrote my own version that's truly multi-threaded and uh, it's up there. So okay. also Sam Morley out of the uh, chat, uh, out of the live stream says, Piehole is great. Yeah, this I've been thinking about setting one of these up. This sounds fun. All right, Kelly, I think you're up next with this one, right? Yeah, so it kind of segues well. You have the Raspberry Pi that's um, something easy for a lot of students to get into. It's cost worthy and stuff. Um, I'm going to throw this out there. It's the app for that. This is Programs. And I'm sure everyone has heard of this uh, website. It's a platform. It's got 50 million people on it. But what's really cool for me is that I'm always looking for something to do on the go. And I download this program as and it's on iOS now, which is great. It launched in iOS last year. And the thing that I love about this over all the other apps out there is it's got a really great IDE interactive shell. It's beautiful. I don't know if you've ever gone to the website of program is or program is, I don't know how you mm -hmm. pronounce it. And it's very clean. So you'll see the same sort of website design on their app. Everything's interactive. They have challenges and programs, but putting that aside, the whole reason why I put this out there is we just had so many kids online from COVID-19 and the digital divide and the kids not being able to access. I went and I looked in UNESCO and I was trying to find out how many kids were actually trying to learn online last year. And they estimated about 826 million learners. And like out of all those learners, 50% of those people did not have a household computer. So these guys who are out in Nepal have brought Python where you can code and learn and program within this tiny little app. And it's just easy to, to go and learn in bite-sized chunks. So had to throw it out there for you guys. Yeah, that's, that's really neat. Uh, what have you all done for remote stuff? Has it, how much has been remote and how much has been in person? So we went back to school in August and it's hybrid half and half. And our kids are lucky because they all have computers and most of them have pretty stable Wi-Fi. Um, 
but I know a lot of the other public school systems, they've had trouble. Kids have had to go to like other people's houses. They've had to borrow some computers. They try to deploy. Um, I know England deployed one of my former schools deployed all these laptops out to all a lot of their free schools or their public schools. So it's been hard for a lot of learners and just to be able to keep up learning on a phone because almost everyone yeah. has a phone. Yeah. So yeah, that and Google docs and zoom and you can kind of piece it together to be able to do multiple things there. Yeah. That's great. It's a good recommendation. Yeah. Does it cost any money? So that's the great part. So there is a free version because there are some really good apps out there that are paid so there's a free version and they do have the advertising, but the advertising is after that chunk of information. So you get this great chunk, you know, you're learning about functions and then there's a quick advert and you can X out. Um, but if you don't want any of the adverts you pay for it, I think it's like 24, 29 a month, but super, super, super. It goes all the way up to um, decorators. So mm -hmm. nice. I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, this is really neat. And it seems like a, a nice little environment. It's got syntax highlighting and all that. Yeah, it's fun. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great recommendation. Uh, Brian, what's your what's your next one here? Uh, what is my next one? Oh, um, <laughs> this is kind of <laughs> neat. Uh, the the New York University is that right? Um, yeah. So there's an announcement that NYU has uh, secured funding in the order of $800,000 over two years um, to, to go towards uh, packaging and the packaging improvement and what else uh, integrating for PIP and downloads and all that sort of stuff, uh, improving the resolver. Um, this is kind of exciting. This is a, this is a lot of money. Yeah. This the, is a really big deal. Yeah. This is awesome. <laughs> Um, the, so I, it, I actually had to look some stuff up. So, um, there is some interesting information there as to like why New York university. Um, so they've been, there's been some researchers that have been working on it for a while. So there's a couple of the things I had to look up. So the, um, uh, specifically, well, let's just say specifically what they're doing. Uh, the, what this money is go going towards, it's to further assess and improve PIP's dependency resolver and then following the, the work done in 2020 and make also make the resolve lib more usable by other tools in the packaging ecology. And then uh, in the PyPI to user pipeline, we've been talking about security problems some on the show and read about others. Uh, they're going to try to integrate the tough support for signed packages through PyPI clients, and they're targeting Conda, Pip, and Bandersnatch. So there's a lot there I had to look up. One, the Resolve Lib. So that is a uh, that is a third party. It's a separate package, but it is related to Pip because it's vendored into Pip. So uh, Resolve Lib is vendored into Pip, and I think they'd like to it to be something that's usable by other other tool chains as well. And so there's improvement needed there. Um, Never heard of Bandersnatch before, or if I have, I've forgotten. It's a PyPI mirror client, um, so, and I think it is is needing some support, so that's good. And then Tuf, what, what the heck is Tuf? So Tuf is the update framework, and it uh, supposedly it helps, according to the website, helps developers maintain the security of software update systems, uh, providing protection against even against attackers that uh, compromise the repository or signing keys. So this this notion of we're building up our, our company even based on a collection of open source packages, that needs to be like solid, right? Um, and, there, and it's more than just signing or uh, pinning your requirements to version numbers. We want to make sure that the sources are there. And there's a, I'm sure there's a lot of details in there that I don't understand fully, but this is a good thing that we work on this more. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, we're, we start to teach our students about, you know, installing packages and how you can use other people's code. And what I'm really hopeful for here with this is that if we can protect this kind of critical infrastructure of, of Python packaging, and at the same time, keep it really simple for people who are entering into Python and learning about this, as well as other aspects of the community, we still want it to be as simple as pip install this or add it to the requirements file, 
but to have that level of trust that what I'm installing is not going to break my comp my code or my machine or put other people at risk, it, it's really valuable to have that level of trust in the system. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, this is amazing. You know, the biggest surprise for me is that so much of this National Science Foundation type of stuff really has to do with um, the, around the whole SciPy side of things. So it's been more focused on, you know, NumPy, Pandas, Conda, and the fact that this is just on PIP and the, the native PyPA stuff is, is pretty interesting, I think. It's also, there's a lot of money. Yeah. I, I mean, I think once you pair this with um, some of the other investments that we're seeing with like, you know, Google uh, investing in, you know, with a PSF at a, a high level, you know, everyone is recognizing this as something that we need to go, go work on and make sure it's, it's right. Yeah. Yeah. So how much do you to talk about external libraries with the kids? Um, we talk about it a lot. I think it's definitely, we started off in the, with the sixth grade, obviously importing turtle and stuff. And I always like to say to them, like, this is where the smart guys coded everything. But, you know, I was corrected a long time ago and just said some really good coders coded this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> everyone can be smart at one time. Actually, we had a kid come in today and ask how he could package his little program. And Sean was um, <laughs> looking for that. And I was like, is it Pi 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 Pal? And he's like, no, not that, Kelly. I'm like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> Yeah, we do. We do a lot with external uh, libraries and packages because that's, you know, really the strength of, of Python as an ecosystem and, and other languages is that it's not just, you know, using the code that you can come up with out of your own head, but being able to leverage the amazing tools that other people have built and shared uh, in the world as well. So we'll go through things like matplotlib. We'll do um, one of my students found the Y finance package and was able to get historical Yahoo finance data out of it and was having a lot of fun with it. So they love learning about all these little packages that they can install yeah. and start working with. They like the I, ones that do like the crazy stuff, like hide their passwords. <laughs> and... <laughs> I bet I can imagine that, you know, it's part of the magic is instead of saying you have to do all this work, you just install this, you run these two lines and then there's something's really cool. Yeah. yeah, what pie pie jokes package? Yes, oh, the pie <laughs> jokes is good. <laughs> but I think that there's, I mean, Sean brought up the question of how do I package my own code to share it, um, and there's there's like tons of different levels of that that are good to, I guess, cover it probably relatively early. You you don't have to push it to PyPI to be able to make a package and email it to somebody or something. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hey. Um, before we jump onto my next item, I just want to pull out a, a quick little uh, fan shout out for Kelly and Sean. Uh, Robert yeah. says, big fan of your podcast. I'm regularly bringing some of your thoughts and suggestions to our science staff here at the Science Center. Very is, uh, cool. Really cool. Very cool. Thank you. All right. So, Brian, I've, I've been known to do an extra, 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 hear all about it type of thing. Yeah. Because I just got too much. Well, this one goes beyond that because this is eight extras all fit into one. <laughs> I'm like, all right, this can't go at the bottom. This is just too much. So I'm going to um, go to uh, try to share this. It's, it won't say they're seeing a blank screen. That's that's uh, not so good. Um, let me see if I can remove it and add it back real quick, uh, and then we'll I'll carry on. We'll have to just roll with it. All right, uh, but extra number one, we are on Audible, Brian, and we are on Amazon Music. Yay. Yeah, this is brand new. I have no idea if anybody's listened to it or anything over here, but uh, there they are. And also, I know uh, Teaching Python is at least on one of these. I'm not sure if it's on both. Uh, yeah, we're on both of those. In fact, my five-year-old sometimes at bedtime, he has a little uh, Amazon Echo Dot in his room. So he'll be like, Alexa, play Teaching Python podcast, and it'll come up and start playing. So it's probably on Alexa also. If you ask for Python Bytes, it'll start playing the latest episode. Yeah, oh, I can't, yeah. <laughs> I can't say that in here. Otherwise, she starts talking. So <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You just set off about 100 million. <laughs> you know, 10,000 Alexis. All right, anyway, so that's really cool that it's it's on there. Um, they reached out to us and invited us to be part of it. I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, they don't like re-encode or re-host or anything. Our stuff, they just share it, which is great. Also, last time I covered, no, Sebastian Ramirez covered sorcery. And I said, I love sorcery as a place, a 
thing to add into VS Code and PyCharm that will automatically recommend refactorings. Like, oh, you should rewrite your code in this cleaner way. But there are certain recommendations I didn't like, and they drove me crazy, and I couldn't turn them off. Well, apparently, since September, you can turn them off, they've told me. <laughs> nice. So a, a couple of listeners uh, uh, as well. Let's see. Yeah, a couple of listeners sent out a message and said, oh, you can do that. And then also the folks over at Sorcery said, hey, you know what? That's actually a thing. A lot of complaints and, and so on. So, Brian, I actually refactored and cleaned up all the Python bytes code, which is like 5,000 lines of Python and refactored it almost with all of their recommendations. And yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. It's really nice now. Okay, well, I definitely get to check it out if you're if you're saying yeah, there, good. yeah, it's it's pretty neat now. So there's like a commit for the Python Bytes website that's, you know, like forty seven files changed or something like that. I had to go through a whole bunch. Anyway, that that's all good. So I can recommend that fully now. Uh, Dustin Ingram, by way of Matthew Fikert, who's been a guest on the show here, um, does a bunch of LHC stuff and certain stuff, uh, pointed out that. You, you know, Dustin Ingram said, uh, I didn't know I could become a PSF member until I realized that just contributing five hours a month towards um, towards it uh, is all you got to do. And then you can self-certify yourself. And he's got a link to, to go find out how to become a PSF member if you'd like. Wow. Nice. Yeah. Uh, a little follow-up by Brandon Brainer. Um, Using Sorcerer, I noticed PyCharm seemed to slow down a lot. Anyone else notice that? Uh, you know, I can't speak to that. On mine, I haven't noticed any difference, but, you know, it's my M1 version, and so it seems all right. Uh, but you, it could on be a my mod. powerful <laughs> computer, I don't see it. <laughs> if or, I was running on the Pi or whatever, yeah. If I was running on Alienware, I definitely wouldn't see it, but I would hear it. <laughs> it works on my machine. It's fine. Exactly. It's fine. <laughs> All right. M more follow up. I mean, this is just going on um, here. Uh, Beanie, the new ODM, the async ODM, object document mapper for talking to MongoDB asynchronously. I said, hey, it should have indexes. Um, they agreed it should have indexes. So they added a whole mechanism to add indexes to MongoDB <laughs> through that, which is pretty awesome. Wow. Power. The power. <laughs> the, the power. <laughs> the power. I recommend it. And if I, I you're was, I was silently hoping that it was going to be a package for like baby beanie babies that can fly across. Maybe we should get Anthony Shaw to like do something like that. <laughs> That's right. Like maybe little animated emojis in the terminal for the kids. Yeah, That'd be fun. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Well, you know, the power of suggestion on Python bytes. Like now <laughs> next week we'll be able to cover the new beanie babies module in beanie. <laughs> exactly. Pip and saw beanie babies. <laughs> They're collectible. And you can even get non-fungible tokens for certain ones. Okay, so <laughs> the next one is a projector. So we talked about remote code execution connecting VS Code through uh, like a remote interpreter or PyCharm. Apparently, there's this thing called projector at JetBrains that will allow you to install the entire UI of something like IntelliJ or PyCharm or something like that and then access it over your web browser but have the entire thing running somewhere else. So you could it'd be good if you have like an environment like an iPad or something where you couldn't, you know, install PyCharm, but now you've got all a full on PyCharm for across the web. So I'll link to that. Another follow up, Brian. We talked about using SQLite as a single file format. So instead of making up your own file format, just put stuff in SQLite. It's just a file. It, it has easy ways to talk to it. Audacity of all things, the audio editing software has been completely rewritten for version three. And guess what? It has a single file format that's SQLite. That's cool, right? <laughs> that, is, that is cool. I used to use it, I see. Yeah. All right. Well, the last time we also talked about NeoModel, which is a way to build Python classes that do graph databases. Super fun. Um, Grayson Daniel said, hey, I came up with this really cool example where you can do things like explore Let's see if I can get over here. We can explore things like, here's a person like Tom Hanks. What movies did they act in? What were they directed by? And then you can just traverse these relationships and explore, like follow the chain of like, well, Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks acted in Castaway, which was directed by Robert so-and-so. And then who else starred in there? And like a really interesting way to like explore those kind of things. I'm surprised they didn't use Kevin Bacon as the example. I know, it, it would have crashed. It would have crashed Michael's M1. <laughs> <laughs> it would have. It would have. All right. I'm right. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, my teaching side of me really loves that little graphic organizer kind. I know. Of, I do too. I'm I thought thinking. I really. Yeah, it's really great, isn't it? All right. And the very last one, El Sergio Sanchez just wanted us to give a shout out that a call for proposals for PyCon 
Latin, uh, Latin America just went live. So people are in uh, Latin America, or I guess, you know, things are remote, really could be anywhere at this point, probably. Uh, so if you want to be part of a conference and speak, uh, go do that. I'm going to nudge Kelly for this one because she actually speaks Spanish, has taught in Peru. Like, Ooh. So I think she'd be a natural fit. <laughs> well, the good thing about it, everything in Python's in English, so we're good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I suspect a lot of those talks are actually in English as well. <laughs> I did attend a charla at the PyCon a couple years oh, ago. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's the Spanish language track. Yeah, that's very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. All right. There's a lot of um, follow-up, a lot of comments here in, in the chat. Um, really quick before we move on, Brandon says, M1 power. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Robert says a couple of, uh, I sent Anthony a few tweets to get this going, but he's so far, he's not made the beating baby thing. <laughs> De Dean's excited about, I'm sorry. There were so many things I don't know which one. Um, uh, Robert asked if I've tried the projector. No, I haven't, but apparently our studios had this as well, which is uh, pretty cool. And Sam Morley says, I still want the walrus operator sticker that Emily Morehouse made for PyCon a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I don't have no idea how to get it though. So. And then uh, Dean is excited about the web UI for, for PyCharm. All, all, all good stuff. All right, Sean, I think you got the final item right here, right? Yeah, yeah. this is a, an article I found because um, we're starting a new quarter in our classroom. So we teach uh, middle school students, uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders that are 11 to 13 years old. And one of the things that I've found from other teachers and instructors, regardless of age level, is those first few classes of a new course are usually filled with the same thing, which is everyone downloading Python. Now we all have the right version of Python. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what editor are we gonna use? Do we have all the same editor version? Now we start to get into dependencies and requirements. And no matter what you're teaching, just those first few classes all seem to be filled with just setting things up, right? And that's not fun for anyone. They're excited to no. get started. And by the time you get to it, like, I'm not excited anymore. I right. hate the terminal. And then, <laughs> and then someone by the end, like, you know, two weeks in is like, well, why isn't this working? It's, oh, because two weeks ago when we set this up, you got version 1.04 and we needed 1.07. And that's why it's not working. It's just a pain to manage all this stuff, right? So I didn't think about using them this way, but there's a whole guide from uh, Bridget Murtaugh at, um, via, from VS Code about making development containers for education. So you can dockerize a development environment and distribute that to students so that each student can just open up a Docker container with all of the right versions, all the right requirements, everything pre-installed, right down to environment variables and starter source code for them to work with. And it's pretty neat. Um, you need VS Code and Docker Desktop to do it the way that they're talking about, but I think you could probably generalize it to a bunch of other things. Um, and in VS Code, you can uh, deploy right from a Docker repo or a GitHub repo. So you give it a repo URL, it'll pull down the, the Docker file, create the Docker container and spin it up for the student and they can start coding right there in VS Code using everything already set up and ready to go. Um, I think the only other requirement is they have to have Docker desktop installed on their computer. So, you know, the one thing that I thought about, like maybe there's a way to, to tinker with this is could we spin up a Docker container on a remote host and then even remove the requirement for Docker desktop on the student's local machine? Um, yeah. You might be able to install something like just the Docker command line tools without full on Docker desktop, which might be something you could do. Just copy them over or something. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. yeah. But I, th there's so many cool things that you could do here. And, you know, yeah. since you can actually run VS Code in a Docker container, you could potentially get to a full Docker package that has VS Code, the Python uh, environment that you want, and all the source code ready to go. Um, and they're even using it for um, individual assignments. So once you've got them set up, tell them, like, hey, here's your next assignment. Here's the uh, container to use. And it gives them everything ready to get started. Yeah, that's really neat. And you both talked about having these cool packages around that, you know, it's really great to just import this thing and do the amazing thing. You could have the Docker container come pre-configured with every package. So you don't even have to talk about virtual environments or PIP or anything till the end when you're like, oh, and by the way, here's how you get this. But it's just right. going to work right out of the box, which is cool. I also like the idea. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Kelly. I was just I was going to make a joke again. That would have saved me because I got lost in my my virtual environment a couple of years ago, and I haven't <laughs> been able to find my way out of the. <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Sean. <laughs> uh, I, the other thing that I, I thought about too, though, is that there's definitely value in still giving the student the manual setup instructions, right? So if we 
you know, give them here's the container version. And then also, if you wanted to set up your own local version, here's how you would do it. That way, students have a chance to differentiate. You know, if they want to just press the button and go with a the container, they can do that. Um, I think Dean in the comments is saying, you know, we could just package the whole com student's whole computer <laughs> inside a Docker container. <laughs> that might work too. Um, It'll be the containers all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, there's definitely a lot of really cool stuff here. And I'm, I'm definitely interested in trying this out because, you know, not just Python, you could do this with a whole ton of different things. Like if you wanted to have a, um, a full stack course, you could have a container for the front end, a container for the back end yeah. and let them develop separately. Yeah, you don't have to worry about how do you set up the database and just do put this line in there and you'll have a database. I mean, that's like for for me, I think that's like a huge win for a lot of people who are getting into code. Just being able to say, Sean, give me that package, let me click on it, open it up and ready to go. That would help a lot of people stay into at least get hooked into coding. Cause messing with terminal, doing all the the folders and the system, it's it's a brutal ride for newbies. Yeah. I agree it is, yeah. And, and Robert definitely likes it. Great find. Yeah, um, yeah nothing nothing else for me on that one. I'm just, I so love you can it. Re you go can it. replace those first two days with getting everybody on the correct version of Docker. That's right. That's right. We just swapped <laughs> one thing for another. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. Well, that's it for our six items. Uh, Brian, anything you want to share? Anything extras? Uh, no, I'm... No, just well, I, yeah, cool. I absolutely over. I blew it out earlier, so we're all good on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see, uh, Kelly, you want to yeah. give a shout out to the, uh, the training summit? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, the education summit. Oh, sorry, the educational summit. So, yeah, this year they are doing both the educational summit and the training summit separately which I thought was really cool. And a lot of the topics that they're looking for is how did we survive with this online virtual environment? How did trainers do it? Not necessarily us in education, but how did the trainers survive with getting through the training? And just they're looking to promote it, I guess. And the fact that you can attend both. I know when we went to PyCon, we had to choose um, mm -hmm. between the educational summit and the uh, training summit, so we weren't were able to do both, and now you can attend everything. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's a real bummer that these conferences aren't in person, right? Like the last time we got to hang out, Kelly and Sean, we had like breakfast in Florida. It was great because we just happened to be in a <laughs> yep. similar general area. That was such a weird happenstance that's not going to happen right now. But the flip side is people can come from all over and attend these conferences no matter what. Now you don't have to actually go there. Yeah, it's great. Sean and I were in Monterey like two weeks ago, <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Virtually, it was the same temperature <laughs> where I was sitting. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. And then uh, some other ones. Are these are yours, Sean? Yeah. Um, so this one I thought was pretty cool. We use Replit a lot in the classroom. So it's, um, you know, online coding environments that you can spin up and, and start coding and, and, and share. And they have really cool features like multiplayer mode where people can be pair programming together in a, um, a shared space. But one of the things that they did, um, speaking of Python packaging, is they had their own package cache that they created for Replit. So for a lot of the common third party mm -hmm. libraries that they are using in a lot of REPLs, they will um, they'll cache it now and they're getting like a 40% speed improvement on spinning up a new replit um, instance when they need it. And then, you know, also just they're not hitting the PyPI index all the time for all that data. It's right there local with them. Um, so they don't have that same sort of uh, load on the caching servers from PyPI. Yeah, that's great. Well done to them for doing that because one, like it makes it better for all their users, but the bandwidth cost if it had to be paid of PyPI is like forty thousand dollars a month it's a lot so put less strain on that system is yeah. a good thing yeah yeah i thought All that right. one was really good um the other one and this is this is a project i'm a huge fan of the home assistant project which runs python 3 um, and you can run it on a raspberry pi mm -hmm. is uh has just uh, the company that runs a lot of that or has a lot of the core developers for that project has acquired the esp home uh project ESP Home is a little side project that lets you take tiny little microcontrollers that cost five or 10 bucks and make your own DIY Internet of Things devices. So this is really a kind of a cool way. You can figure it with a YAML file and you can push the YAML file over to that microcontroller and 
you can um, make your own little devices. So I made a um, a pool uh, heater controller for my swimming pool here in Florida oh, using nice. a, an ESP home microcontroller. So they have all these great examples. People have done things like NFC sensors, so you can tap tags and play music, uh, Roomba components, um, washing machine phases. So you can tell when your washing machine's on and off. They have basically all this great stuff there. And Nabu Casa, the company that has all these core developers, just bought it and is bringing it under the Home, ins home Assistant umbrella. Oh, that's cool. Home Assistant will just get better. And Home Assistant is in Python as well, which is neat. Yeah, they're running they're running 3.9, I think, on it. They're really keeping oh, up with the latest versions of everything. So this last one I want to show, I can only show you half a screen. Oh, wait, no, it goes up now. They were angry at me because my ad blocker in Firefox, apparently, which I, is just bare Firefox, it wouldn't let me show the whole page. Anyway, here we go. So uh, get a vaccine appointment. you got to do some web scraping. Right. So it helps to know a Python programmer. And this was on NBC News, so I thought it was kind of, a, kind of neat that it made it to this mainstream of an outlet. But they were saying that uh, basically Python programmers have been web scraping to find vaccine appointments and they go into the ethics of that. Like, is it OK to web scrape and basically get yourself to the front of the line? Uh, but a lot of folks have been making this information available via Twitter bots as well. So if you're trying okay. to wait and get a vaccine appointment, maybe look and see if there's a um, Twitter account near you that's showing you what uh, spaces are available. How interesting. Yeah, this is a, it's a pretty good use of it. You know, when I went to college, we didn't really have the internet. I guess when I first started, it came on like two or three years later, we had, I mean, the internet, but not the web. And we had to register by phone. So you would call and it would be busy and he would call back and we'd be busy and you have to do it for four or five hours. And we just took our modems and we just war dialed the registration number one, one cement, like we had really bad classes, you know, early morning on a Monday or whatever. And then we decided, oh, we're breaking out the modem. We're just going to go dial, hang up, dial, hang up, dial, hang up until it answers. And we, we had the perfect schedule, my brother and I, that, <laughs> so this is like the modern equivalent of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and they were, nobody was breaking any rules or anything other than yeah. the web scraping part. It was all, you know, my 70 year old grandmother needs to get a vaccine appointment. Instead of spending six hours hitting refresh on the web page, I'm going to automate that. Yeah, it's it's a perfect example of uh, automation that that helps. Yeah, very cool. I, I don't really see anything wrong with it until maybe you take down the server, but so many people are hitting it. But as long as it doesn't do something like that, I think okay. I think us humans are fully capable of uh, taking down the vaccine appointment web servers on our own. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hitting the refresh button. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Well, uh, Brian, I think that's it for all of our items. Uh, do we have a joke? You think? I think we might have a joke. Yeah, I like this joke. Yeah, let's see. Is this this is? Oh no, this is not it. Let me let me. I gotta copy the. Is this gonna work? I don't think. No, I gotta gotta do a quick screenshot to get it up in the screen share. Sorry, it's not logged on that computer. Okay, so here comes the joke, and this one I put out there because I I thought it was a good a one for teachers, and it talks about basic math really, All right? So this is a. Uh, let me put it back on my screen. This one is about counting, just one to 10. And uh, a famous person in computers, Bill Gates. And I think this is like, a, hey, I'm, I'm coming to visit the school. I work in computers. I'll help you learn how to count. It says, hi, my name is Bill Gates. And today I'll teach you how to count to 10. One, two, three, 95, 98, NT, 2000, XP, Vista, 7, 8, 10. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? I, I mean, I, I find it I find it interesting that uh, ME is not in this list, which just goes to prove that even 21 years later, there is nothing funny about Windows ME. <laughs> I think that might be the only Windows I've never had. <laughs> you are lucky. <laughs> I, I keep thinking I keep thinking about the silly joke of my seven year old. What happened to nine? Because seven, eight, nine. Yes. Oh, and it fits in there perfectly, right? Oh, yeah. And the reason that nine, they, there's not a Windows 9 is even weirder. I wish it was the joke, but people, <laughs> because there was a 95 and a 98, people were doing substring matches to see if it was Windows 95 or is it like if the string Windows 9 appears in the, just in the version number, well, it must be 95 or 98. And so the Windows 9 would have the same problem. But anyway. oh, I read that it was because, uh, 
um, rumor had it that Japanese and Japan, they skipped it because it was like a, it mean a bad thing or something. Oh, it's like 13. Unlucky, for, yeah, what, unlucky yeah, number. Yeah. I, can, I, I guess Microsoft, as well. Yeah, Microsoft and Japan had a lot going on. So. Interesting. You know, I, um, I've stayed on the 14th floor before where it goes 12, 14. I'm like, no, this is, this is the unlucky floor. I know it. You're not you fooling fly. anyone. You're not fooling anyone. I'm okay. Nothing happened on the trip, but I'm on the 13th floor. I know it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very interesting trip that one. But uh, save it for some beers and we can all get together at an actual conference again. Yeah. We're looking yeah. forward to it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sean and Kelly, thank you both for being on the show. It's been great to have you here. Oh, thanks, thanks. for uh, having us. We we miss seeing you guys. Yeah, well. yeah, this is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Brian, good to see you as always, man. Good to see you. Yep. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.